Thank you everyone <laughs> for joining our webinar today. Um, Busara Center of Economics and India Behavioral Economics Network are glad to host Professor George Lewinstein to share his perspective on the psychological factors affecting the success of measures to decrease the spread of COVID-19. I'm Anisha from Busara, who, whoever didn't hear our earlier <laughs> conversation, um, and I have Janafi with me from IBEN who will co-host today. Globally, but typically in developing countries, there has been a tendency to blame everything on structural factors that come in the way of development. This time has been quite the same. Medical inadequacy, poor infrastructure, lack of available equipment, for instance, have come to the fore once again as some of the reasons for the continuing pandemic. However, it's been encouraging to see that for the first time, um, behavioral science in its various shapes and forms has gained importance in its ability to unlock questions around human behavior that are key to containing the spread of COVID-19. People have realized that in this fight against COVID, psychological factors are at play in different forms and need to be addressed to enable the success of these preventive measures. This will only become more evident in the weeks to come as we see governments lifting lockdown across various countries. What we need now is a more nuanced understanding of how behavioral fatigue is setting in and what can be done to prevent it, how people are perceiving risk and what denominators they're using to estimate the probability of contracting the virus, how to counter the intangibility of the benefits of preventive measures, how to ensure people aren't licensing some measures for others, and how we can target overconfidence where people feel that it would just wouldn't happen to them. These are just some of the questions in this Pandora's box that need a better understanding. And who else to answer some of these than George himself? George Lewinstein is a Herbert A. Simon Professor of Economics and Psychology in the Social and Decision Sciences Department at Carnegie Mellon University. He's also the director of the Center for Behavioral Decision Research. He's one of the pioneers in the field of behavioral economics and neuroeconomics. And while George needs no further introduction, in Richard Taylor's words, as described in Misbehaving, most of the advances in the field of behavioral economics have been to figure out how best to modify the tools of economics to accommodate humans as well as econs, rather than discovering new insights about behavior. Of the emerging economists that have become leaders of the field, only George Lewinstein has really created much new psychology. In terms of format for the webinar today, we'll have George present first and share some of his thoughts on the topic. We'll follow this with a few questions from the organizers and then open to audience questions. We hope you have tons to ask because we've kept a lot of time for these questions from you at the end. We've also received some questions in advance, which is great. Please use the question and answer function on your end to send in your questions and then we'll pass them on to George to get his thoughts. I'll hand it over to you, George, and I think everybody can see your screen already. Oh, wonderful. Thanks for that um, great introduction, Anisha. I, I don't remember whether I shared my talk with you, but I might as well have, because it, it's really a perfect lead into what I'm gonna be talking about. The, the work I'm gonna be talking about is, uh, part of it is based on an op-ed that um, Gretchen Chap, my colleague Gretchen Chapman and I um, wrote and ended up publishing in the conversation. I found that the virus has been a, a bit of a muse for me. I've been kind of dashing out uh, op-eds. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been very successful in placing them, but I, I think a lot of academics have had the same reaction as I've had, and um, this has been a flood of people writing op-eds, and so it's very difficult to get them published these days. In any case, um, oh, let me also um, thank um, Samantha or Sammy Horn, who has an affiliation with Busara and helped me um, improve the presentation. All right, um, as you know, in the United States, um, we don't only have a virus happening, but we also have um, a, another um, set of events happening around um, r racial issues. This is a demonstration I was at a few days ago in Pittsburgh. And I think it's, um, the picture reveals a few things that are uh, pretty interesting. Um, one is uh, most of the people are 
in the picture are wearing masks. The only person I can see in the picture who is not wearing a mask is, um, interestingly, the most prominent individual in the bottom right-hand corner. I'd like to think that the, re the reason people are re um, wearing masks is, is because they're just very cautious, they're very aware of the virus, but unfortunately, in the United States, um, wearing masks uh, wearing a mask and taking precautions has become a political issue. That's not something I'm actually going to talk about in the in this talk, although um, certainly feel free to ask me questions about it. So I think the mask wearing, the, the prevalence of mask wearing at this demonstration is probably more a factor of political, it's more an, um, a product of political factors than it is of health factors. The other thing that's worth noting is my guess is that a lot of the people in this picture have been behaving very well in these virus times. They've been socially di they've been socially distancing, sheltering at home, and so on. But here's this huge crowd of people compressed together. Why are they all suddenly taking these risks? I th I think there's a lot of things going on here, but. Part of it is that I think that people can really only concern themselves with about one thing at a time. And so now that the Black Lives Matter movement has, has come to the fore, the virus has receded to some degree. And I think also that people kind of tend to anthropomorphize the virus to some degree. There's a kind of unconscious feeling that um, if, we're, if, if I'm demonstrating for a good cause, I'm not going to get sick from that. Unfortunately, the virus has no clue about why we're demonstrating or whether it's a good cause or a bad cause. So it's a bit worrisome that some of the most, in my view, right-minded people in the United States are going to be at greatest risk. Let me get on to, the, to my talk, um, which is about the, what the title says, Psychological Factors Affecting the Success of measures to decrease the spread of COVID-19. Um, so we've been asked to take a lot of measures like hand washing and social distancing. And in the op-ed with Gretchen, we argue that um, it's very difficult to motivate oneself to, do the, to engage in these behaviors. Um, we're, we're both actually quite surprised at how successful the efforts have been to get people to engage in these behaviors. I never would have predicted that they would have been as successful as they have been. So most of my talk is a, a, exactly about why we would have been pessimistic and why we are pessimistic about the continuing ability of policymakers to get individuals to take these measures. I think as I'm going to talk about in a bit, um, I'm particularly pessimistic about the um, event in the event that there is a second wave. I'm very particularly um, pessimistic about the um, possibility of um, persist, people persisting in these behaviors. Okay, so why are these behaviors very difficult to maintain? There's a lot of different behavioral reasons. Um, the first and the most obvious one is present bias and intangibility. Uh, present bias is just the fact that we tend to respond very powerfully to costs and benefits that are immediate, and much less so to costs and benefits that are delayed. And intangibility is the idea that we tend to have a difficult time getting motivated about um, things that are, have intangible consequences. So this applies, for example, to dieting. Um, one dieting on for one day is not going to have an appreciable impact on your weight. Um, smoking one day will not have an appreciable impact on your chance of getting lung cancer. So these are intangibility and present bias often have very similar consequences. Um, applied to COVID-19, both of these factors tend to work against people taking um, mitigating behaviors like hand washing and social distancing. If you think about the preventive behaviors, the cost of these behaviors are immediate. It's inconvenient to wash your hands every, every few minutes, and it's um, just disturbing to socially distance. 
whereas the benefits are delayed. And similarly, the benefits are intangible. You can't touch, taste, feel, or see the benefits of, for example, disinfecting your doorknobs. At the same time, the benefits of the misbehaviors, like let's say um, spending time in person with friends, perhaps without a mask, those are tend to be immediate, and the costs of doing that are delayed and uncertain and also intangible. That is, they lead to a small increase in the probability of negative consequences. So let me first talk a, a little bit about um, probability. Some of you are, um, probably many of you, if you are immersed in the behavioral literature, are probably knowledgeable about prospect theory. This is the um, theory of decision-making under risk that was largely responsible for Kahneman winning the Nobel Prize. Um, and one of the two main dimensions of prospect theory involves how we weigh or weight probabilities. So in this diagram here, um, on the x-axis, we have the actual probability of an event that somebody faces. And on the y-axis, we have the, actual, the weight that they put on that event. And I've highlighted, a and this is what's called the probability weighting function. It shows you for a particular objective probability how much people care about that probability of something happening. And I've highlighted a particular element, a particular um, region of the probability weighting function to, because this is really probably the most important part of the probability weighting function that produces a lot of the interesting behavioral consequences. So what are the features here? The first is over here, for very low probabilities, you can see that the decision weight exceeds the stated probability, that is, um, the dotted line represents all situations in which the decision weight is equal to the stated probability. So when this line is above the dotted line, that means that decision makers are overweighting outcomes. So the first property of prospect theory is that people, of the prospect theory probability weighting is that people tend to overweigh or overweight small probabilities. But the second property is that this curve tends to be very flat. Um, what that means is that people are insensitive to changes in probabilities. For example, people react about the same to a one in a thousand chance or a one in 10,000 chance or even a one in a million chance, even though, even though those probabilities differ by orders of magnitude. This is probably responsible for why, partly responsible for why people buy lottery tickets because there's a very small chance of winning, but people are, are really people overweight small probabilities and they are insensitive to changes in probabilities. In the, in the United States, we have these jackpot lotteries and when they increase, um, the lottery authorities um, took measures that decreased the chance of winning them and increased the size of the jackpots and that led to a huge increase in the number of people playing and that's because when it went from like a one in a billion to a one in a trillion chance of winning, people didn't really care. It seemed like about the same probability to them, but the, the increase in the size of the jackpots was highly salient. And the last feature is way, way over here on the left-hand side. And what this shows is that there's a huge drop from a probability, from the overweighting of small probabilities to the zero weight that we place on things that are, Im that are impossible, that have no chance of occurring. So what do, all these have, what do all these properties have to do with our response to COVID-19? The first is the overweighting of small, small probabilities is probably a good thing in terms of affecting people's responses. Um, if people overweigh a risk, that um, they're, they're more likely to respond to it behaviorally. They're more likely to take action. So that's probably a good thing. The other two features of probability weighting, the insensitivity to changes in probability and the huge drop from, prob from positive probabilities to zero, um, on the other hand, probably have pernicious effects. Um, these, these features tend to reduce 
the motivation to engage in uh, preventive actions um, because recommended behaviors only reduce the chance of getting the disease, but they don't eliminate the chance of getting the disease. And people are insensitive to changes in probabilities unless those changes lead to a drop to zero chance of getting something. There's a lot of evidence from other related domains that um, people are insensitive to reductions in probabilities. For example, um, there's research showing that people are willing to pay much more to reduce a pesticide risk from five in 10,000 to zero in 10,000 than they are to reduce the, the risk from 15 in 10,000 to 10 in 10,000, even though those reductions in risk are objectively similar. People are more attracted to a vaccine that's said to el entirely eliminate a 10% risk for a disease than to um, a vaccine that reduces the risk from 20% to 10%. And finally, a vaccine that's described as 100% effective, which people love, in preventing 70% of known cases of a disease is uh, more appealing to people than one that is 70% effective in preventing all cases. So in all of these, there's a lot of evidence showing that people are just not very excited about reducing risks um, unless they can reduce the risk to zero. And of course, all of these different behaviors like hand washing and social distancing don't eliminate the risk of getting COVID-19, they just reduce it. Another behavioral factor that reduces people's motivation to take action is the invisible impact or, uh, of taking those actions and the lack of feedback we get. So the microbes are invisible. We have no idea whether we had them before we washed our hands or whether we got rid of them after we washed our hands. We get no positive feedback that our preventive action has reduced our probability of getting infected. So we're already not very motivated by reducing probabilities, but we don't even get feedback about our re the reduction in probabilities that we are able to achieve. Similarly, um, not being sick was the state we were in before we took these actions. And so when we take these actions and we're not sick, it seems like the preventive actions that we took had caused nothing to happen. They had no effect. And that's because um, we can't see the negative outcome that is getting sick that might have happened if we hadn't been so vigilant. There's again, a lot of evidence supporting these ideas. Um, for example, people point to the low rates of disease that happen in societies that have successfully combated COVID as, evidences, as evidence that the sacrifices they were asked to make weren't actually necessary, ignoring the fact that the sacrifices were what led to the low rates of the disease. This, um, I don't know, if in India you have this uh, movement of people who are opposed to vaccinations, but that's very prevalent in the United States, and it's leading to all sorts of um, diseases like um, measles that um, were dormant, were basically gone, um, had disappeared, coming back again. And these anti-vaxxers, they claim that the low rates of disease are evidence that the vaccine isn't needed and wasn't needed in the first place, even though the vaccine is exactly the, what um, produced the low rates of the disease. So again, a second feature, a, a second property that leads to um, low motivation to take these actions is the invisible impact of taking them and the lack of feedback that we get about the impact of engaging in these behaviors. Um, a, a third factor is uh, um, something that I, I first um, labeled um, an interpersonal empathy gap. When you're in one emotional state, it's very difficult to be imagine being in a different, a different emotional state. When you're angry, it's def very difficult to imagine not being angry, but, um, which is why a lot of people take um, actions that they later regret when they're in an angry state. But Probably the, the strongest empathy gaps have to do with situations where you're not in an emotional state, trying to imagine being in an emotional state or a state of, of pain um, and so on. And so one implication of these interpersonal empathy gaps is that when you're healthy, 
it's very difficult to imagine being sick, even when you've been sick in the past, even when people who have gotten sick from COVID, for example, are telling you how terrible it is. If you're healthy, it's just really difficult to imagine being sick. And this, again, probably has something to do with low rates of adherence um, to COVID. There's a lot of evidence that people are generally not very adherent to life-saving measures. Like, for example, only a year after being hospitalized for a heart attack, um, you'd think that everyone who had a heart attack would be taking medications to prevent getting another heart attack, but nearly half of the patients who have had heart attacks have forgot, start, stop, have stopped taking their medications by a year after the heart attack. Similarly, the rates of medication adherence for acute diabetes are similarly dismal, even though the consequences of not taking the medication are quite um, dire, things like um, um, losing limbs, for example. Another really important um, factor is adaptation. Um, people, humans are adaptive. It's like um, if, if there is a risk, we tend a new risk, we tend to be really afraid of it. But then if, not, if the new risk persists, it's our brains kind of interpret that as a situation. Well, I, got him, I made him scared and he didn't do anything, so there must be nothing that he can do about it. So there's no reason to keep the fear going. So we tend to adapt to risks that are constant, that certainly risks that are decreasing, or even risks that are very gradually increasing. We stop being scared when risks are in the background. And there's lots of evidence of this happening. Like for example, in the Blitz during World War II in London, people were at first very, very frightened by the bombing, but after a while they got used to it and just started living pretty normal lives. And there's many, many different um, examples of this. Um, the effect, this effect is especially strong when there's little perceived hope of improvement. We tend to adapt when we don't think that things can be improved, which relates to my earlier point that people generally don't think that the efforts that they take have very, a very big impact. I, um, this is, I'll use this as an excuse to show you a little bit of research that I worked on um, with Peter Eubel and colleagues. This is a paper we, tied, um, we published titled Happily Hopeless Adaptation to, permanent, to a Permanent but Not to a Temporary Disability. This is a study we ran with patients who got um, colostomy, colostomies. A, a colostomy is an operation in which you're bowel empties into a bag um, that you have attached to your um, abdomen. And so, mo you know, most people, it's not considered to be a very desirable um, situation. Um, we interviewed people who, who um, had surgically implanted colostomies at three points in time one week after they were released from the hospital, a month after they were released, and six months after they were released. And the key feature of the study was that there were two types of, pa of patients. Some of these patients had colostomies that were permanent. They couldn't possibly, they, there was no chance that they would ever be reversed. And another group of these patients had colostomies that were potentially reversible. That was the main independent variable from the study, even though we weren't actually able to manipulate it experimentally. And here are the results. The blue lines show the people who had, this is on the y-axis, we have life satisfaction. The results for measures of happiness are very similar. And what you see, the blue line shows the life satisfaction of the people who had the reversible colostomies. Initially, it was, um, and not surprisingly, it was higher for the people who had the reversible colostomies than people who had the permanent colostomies after one week after having the operation. But what you can see is that it dropped over time. Um, they, got, they got more and more miserable, the people who had the colostomies that were potentially reversible. But the people with the permanent colostomies got, got happier and happier and, and more satisfied with their lives over time. There was something about the permanence of the colostomy that um, led people to adapt to it. It's probably that they thought, well, I'm not gonna change this, so I might as well deal with it. 
actually by six months, these people are indistinguishable from normal healthy people, the level, their level of life satisfaction. So what this shows is that adaptation is particularly strong when there's little perceived hope of improvement. Hope generally impedes adaptation to bad situations and all, it's also true of, of risks. There's also a wide range of different types of kind of cognitive distortions that come into play in a situation like the one we're facing. There's a lot of superstitions, like for example, the one I mentioned before. I'm not going to get demonstrate, I'm not going to get infected at this demonstration because it's a good cause. Well, COVID-19 has no idea whether the demonstration you're going to is a good cause or a bad cause. And if it did, who knows whether its view of what's a good cause and a bad cause would even be the same as your view of what's a good cause and a bad cause. Um, there's erroneous learning from feedback. I haven't gotten infected so far. That must mean I'm not at high risk. Um, so that's, that's a very dangerous kind of cognition. There's also a lot of motivated reasoning. Suppose you are single and you've been socially isolating and, isolating and you're desperate to go out on a date. Well, your brain is going to figure out why going out on a date is not really so dangerous. Like, I really want to go out on this date. She seems healthy. One encounter is so unlikely to get me infected. Your brain is going to, if you really want to do something, your brain is going to figure out a way to justify why it is okay to do it, why you're not taking as big a risk as other people might, um, as the evidence might suggest that you are taking by engaging in the behavior. So in sum, there are myriad factors that weigh against the persistence of widespread um, behavioral measures to combat the spread of COVID-19. Um, Anisha, I have a few more things I was going to talk about, behavioral things, but tell me whether, I wonder, I see that I've gone for half an hour. Yeah. Do you think I should skip to the end? <laughs> um... Sure, maybe we'll leave some place for questions and then if they tie into what you were gonna say, we can cover it as part of that already. Okay, so let me end on a, on a high note. Um, I think there, there, even though I've been going through a lot of different factors that can, um, that reduce people's motivation to take um, preventive measures, there are some factors that play a positive role. Um, one factor is norms. When other people are taking preventive measures, that creates some um, um, descriptive and also injunctive norms that people are that people tend to follow. That's a positive um, factor if a lot of people are taking actions. It's not such a positive fa um, fa um, factor. It kind of weighs in the opposite direction if if um, behaviors tend to deteriorate. Deteriorate. Other people's behaviors tend to deteriorate. Behaviors are kind of infectious. Um, and the second is the second positive factor is habits. Once you get into the habit of social distancing, once you get into the habit of hand washing, once you do it over and over again, it tends to create a habit, and that makes it easier to engage in the behavior because you're used to doing it, you know how to do it, and so on. Um, another factor that could play a positive role would be inspirational leadership. Um, political leadership can make, and other types of leadership can make a huge difference. And we have had it in the past. And so in, your, in India, in the United States, so we know what it is. We also know, um, know it when we don't see it as well. So let me end with that. And thank you for listening. And I'd love to take your questions. Awesome. 
Um, I think we'll, I'll go ahead with one or two questions and then we'll move to the ones from the audience. So thank you, George, that was super engaging. And I think what you said about human nature being adaptive really clicked with me because it brings us to what we are seeing today and also forces us to sort of think harder about how we think about resilience in populations and adaptation of populations, especially for um, low income or rural populations across the world. And also the point about like how you open the talk with the political nature that's going around now and and superstitions around that it's less likely to contract when you go to the when you go to a religious institution is super interesting because those are some of the institutions that are opening up first as well. Um, so we have some questions, maybe one or two from my side, and then we can move to Janafi sort of um, collating back the audience ones. Um, what I wanted to know from you was that you also recently spoke about information preference and that sometimes we don't want to know certain information and that also contributes to how we behave and how we adhere to various preventive measures. So if we're talking about COVID-19, um, what information do you think people would not want to know and how should we go about identifying what people would and would be better off like not knowing um, in a way? Well, as, as I, yeah, as I think you know, I, I recently wrote a paper about information avoidance um, with Russell Goldman and David Hagman. And um, in that paper, we talk about a wide range of motives um, that lead people to um, not want to get information. Uh, of course, probably the biggest motivation is that they don't, they're worried about that the information will be bad and that, that it will lead them to feel bad. Um, perhaps the most important motive for information avoidance in the, um, that relates to the virus is um, people sometimes are motivated to avoid information because they, the information that they get might force them to behave in ways that they don't want to behave. So not getting the information, as long as they don't have the information, they, can, they feel kind of morally licensed to behave the way they want to behave. So I think that one um, type, one reason that people avoid information during the virus is, that one type of information that people avoid is getting, some people might not want to get tested because they don't want to know that they are potentially contagious, they want to go to work or they want to interact with people. And so this could easily play an important role in testing. I want to, um, since a big focus of Busara is and the Behavioral Policy Network is, poli is policy, um, I should also mention that you know, policymakers have to decide what kinds of information to give to people. And I think one of the big issues is there's really kind of two categories of information, statistical information and case information. And I think policy makers are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. There's, they have a dilemma because people tend to overreact to case information and they tend to underreact to statistical information. For example, um, we did some research on something called the identifiable victim effect, which is that people are much more sympathetic and helpful towards identifiable victims than towards statistical victims. And we found that when there's an identifiable victim, people are very generous towards that victim, but they're very ungenerous when they're given statistics. And we also found that when you do give people both statistics and case information, their generosity tends to drop to the lowest common denominator. I think this is really important in the context of the virus because when you give people emotional information, they, I, I do think it's possible that they tend to over-respond. Like in the New York Times, the, which is the main publication that I read, they, they keep having stories about individuals getting sick and all the terrible things that happen to them. And I think that that leads to a inflated view of the risk of the virus. On the other hand, when people get statistics, they're probably, that leads to kind of an underreaction and people um, just feel kind of overwhelmed by the statistics and they're much less likely to, act, to respond um, in terms of taking behavioral measures. So I think that this is a big issue for policymakers. Yeah, I think that's very true. 
um, when you talk about like total, there's the other side of it is that when you talk about total deaths as a percentage of population, um, it also can seem that it's such a low percentage rate. Um, and then people sort of underestimate the probability and then they don't remain vigilant for what they should be doing. So I think there are also thoughts around there and how we can make the risk actually more salient. Um, that's super interesting. So I think we can move to questions from the audience. Uh, Janafi, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the first question that we have is, um, so when people are faced with several bad options, they often exhibit risk-seeking risk behavior. For instance, very poor daily wage workers in India have to make choices between going to work to feed themselves and social distancing. Uh, in these sort of situations, how do we motivate people, especially the low income and marginalized population, who are seeing only the downsides or losses to take precautions and engage in preventing, preventive behaviors? Well, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. People tend to make bad decisions when they're faced with only bad options. And I think the, the reason for that is that the brain keeps um, coming back to, the, our brain would kind of like to think, oh, there must be some good option. And so we keep um, filtering through the bad options, thinking that there has to be a good option. And we're not really processing the trade-offs involved, but um, the trade-offs between the different bad options. I mean, I think that very often there are different ways of viewing a problem. That um, when you, right right now, for example, we in the United States, it, it's widely perceived that we have two options. One is like to close down the economy, and the other is to experience lots of deaths, like open up the economy, but experiencing lots of deaths. And these seem like really bad options. But I think that um, if you change the way that you think about it, sometimes um, you can lead, you can improve your decision making. So there, um, what we really need to be thinking about is, are there ways to get the best of both worlds? At a this is true at a policy level. Is there a way to protect the most vulnerable people, but to open the economy at the same time? It's kind of it, it's a it's sort of a false dichotomy: economics versus health. Um, there are ways of achieving the best of both worlds. Now, I'm not exactly sure how that would apply to the options of a poor worker. The, all the different types of negative options of the poor worker, but probably the, there are ways that the poor worker could maximize their income while minimizing their health risk. And what the policymakers should be oriented towards um, doing is trying to provide ideas to people who really have to work about exactly how to best navigate those trade-offs. Another question. Yeah. Uh, Thanks so much, there's a request for you to show yourself and not the screen. Um, uh, oh. That would be helpful. Um, so whoever pointed that out, thank you. Um, I can go on to another question that came in. Um, when individuals are given multiple preventive measures, do you think there comes a point at which individuals start prescribing different weights to the efficacy of each behavior? And therefore that leads to a point in which there's a sort of master measure that is believed to take care of the entire risk single-handedly. And if so- Wait, so I'm sorry, I was, I was distracted. Can you see me now? Um, yeah, we can see you. Yes. Sorry, can you go back again? Because I was um, focused on trying to get Zoom to stop screen sharing. Can you, can you start at the beginning of the question again? Yeah. So I think one question that came in asks that when individuals are given multiple preventive measures, do you think there comes a point where individuals start prescribing differential weights to these measures and then the efficacy of each measure as well? And therefore that leads to a situation which there's a sort of master measure that is believed to take care of the entire risk single-handedly. Um, and I think relatedly, like if you think that's happening right now, what should we be looking out for or how should we be countering that? 
I think this is very closely related to the last um, the last question, and I think I think um, there's a expression. I think it, maybe it goes back to Descartes. Um, the expression is the best is the enemy of the good, and and I think that really applies to a situation where there are multiple measures that if you give people, if you tell people too many things to do, they will end up just throwing up their hands and saying, um, there's nothing I can't, there is nothing I can do about the, about the situation. And so it is very like um, at the beginning of the um, virus here, we were told that when you go um, food shopping, you need to, um, when you go food shopping, you need to sanitize the food before you bring it into your house. And that was on top of the hand washing, on top of the social distancing, and so on. And I think that um, it's a mistake to try to get people to do too many things at the same time. It's very important for policy ma uh, makers to decide what are the two or three most important actions for people to take and to really focus in on those. It's really tempting to add, oh, they should also be doing this, they should also be doing that, but um, not only are they unlikely to do those extra things, but it's like uh, when you ask people to do too many things, it's likely to adversely impact the most important things. And this is really related to the earlier um, question about when there are multiple bad options, um, what, should you, what should people do? It's really important to focus in on the things that uh, matter and, th and not focus on the things that are the kinds of um, measures or behaviors that are likely to, much more likely to have a small impact. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so I'll, I'll read out the next question for you then. Uh, do you think that there is a high probability of human behavior reverting back to previous ways after COVID-19? Or will habits formed during physical distancing stick for longer? So I think the person just wants to know your thoughts on that. So. I, th I mean, I think that there's a general human bias to, to think that the present is going to last that however you feel or whatever you're thinking in the present is going to last. It, that actually relates to empathy gaps. And um, in fact, things change, people change much more rapidly than they recognize. So right now I've noticed like, um, like many other people, I'm watching a lot of um, TV, watching a lot of movies, and you see people in, crowd situations interacting with one another freely and you have a kind of a feeling of kind of a horror reaction. Oh no, they're gonna infect one another. And that's because the infection, infection, the spread of infection has become so salient for us at this exact moment. Um, but in the, in the same way that people in those movies were not concerned about um, infection, um, but we are, I, I think pretty rapidly, once the virus ends, people are gonna go back to the way that they were. We're, we're much more ad adaptive than we appreciate. We, we um, one of the most, um, like for example, if you, if you think about something like the colostomy, people, if you ask people, how would you feel a year after getting a colostomy? Colostomy, people think, oh, I'd be, um, I would feel terrible. It's true that they would feel terrible in the first week after getting the colostomy, but after a year, they're just going to feel normal like any other person. So there's a general tendency to underpredict our own adaptation, and I think that's true here. As soon as the virus is a thing of the past, let's say if there's a a vaccine, an effective vaccine that is um, developed and disseminated. We're going to go back to being pretty much the way that we were in the past. I don't think that they, there certainly could be lasting effects on the economy if a lot of businesses if a lot of um, businesses close and have a tr have trouble reopening. But I don't think that there's going to be much of a lasting impact on human 
psychology. Um, okay, the next one picked on your point about dating and asks that what do you believe are the major behavioral factors that will come into play when people start dating in a post-COVID world? <laughs> um, I mean, that's tricky. I, I mean, I think um, a big, a really big issue is that there are these um, huge individual differences in how frightened people are and in how extensive the measures are that people are taking. So like, um, I, I tend to be on the unafraid side of the spectrum, like probably dramatically so. Um, I'm probably taking fewer measures than most people. And on two occasions, I've tried to get together with friends and those friends, um, actually in both cases, my friends wanted to get together, but their families vetoed them getting together um, with me. And that created some kind of bad feelings. Like I, um, I, I felt bothered that they didn't want to take the same risks that, that I was willing to take. And so I think that one of the factors that's likely to come into play in, in dating as dating starts to loosen up in the same way that the economies are starting to loosen up is that there'll be big differences between people in what they're willing to do. I mean, there, that's, that's obviously already a big issue in dating that um, people, the two people involved in a date often have different ideas about what they'd like to do during the date. But now there's gonna be this new element, which is um, pr taking protective measures and risk taking and so on. So I do think that the virus is going to complicate risk taking, uh, uh, is, is going to complicate, it's gonna introduce new complications to, date, um, to dating, which is unfortunately already a very awfully complicated domain of behavior. That, that's quite interesting. <laughs> So the next question is, uh, you mentioned that individuals are adaptive in nature and will soon adapt to the risk from COVID. Uh, what can be some ways to counter this adaptive behavior of people in the pandemic when a solution seems to be far off? Well, I mean, the, in, my res, in my response to the last question, I was assuming that the virus is over, basically, that we, we have a vaccine. and in that case, I think it would be will be a good thing for people to adapt to the virus, to adapt to the to the new situation, which is similar, you know, to go back to their old ways. While the virus is still raging, and while there's still a risk of spread and of contagion, it is at, really policymakers should be concerned about the opposite. They should not want people to adapt to it um, because we, um, until the virus is a thing of the past, we don't want people to go back to their old ways. And um, for that, I think that the, some of the research that I talked about on the study I showed you titled Happily Hopeless is relevant. You need um, people, if, the, if people feel like the situation is hopeless, like that there's nothing they can do, to avoid the catching the virus, they're going to their their behavior is going to adapt, and they're going to um, stop. They're going to they'll adapt to the risk. It will stop being frightening to them, and they will go back to their old behaviors. So, when it comes to as long as we are still in a situation where it's really important for people to take these actions, we don't want people to adapt to it, and. As my research shows, um, hope is very important for that. Um, we need to, people need to be given hope that they cannot catch the virus, that the measures that they take will avoid them from catching the virus. That's probably the number one factor that's going to um, affect adaptation. So adaptation, once again, it's a bad thing during the virus and it's a good thing after and policymakers need to be thinking about both of those. 
Yeah. A little more on policymakers. One of the questions is that as stay at home orders progress, people seem to be going through various states, start, um, say starting out hopefully to feeling uncertain, to anxious, and then further to fatigue. How should policymakers acknowledge and adapt to these states and come up with useful information? Um, particularly, how, can you, how do you think policymakers should combat the risk of that they face by updating information constantly um, while still keeping this adaptability and sort of the mood and feeling of people in mind? Well, people, um, people do get fatigued. I, th I think there's only so long that you can engage in behaviors like um, social And I don't really think that there's any kind of information that policymakers can give individuals that is going to counteract that. Um, if it's very, very important for people to social distance, if this, if as the virus continues, I think um, it will require more and more heavy handed policies from policymakers, like um, laws and regulation and sanctions for violating social distancing. I'm not advocating those things, but I think that if the policy, if policymakers want to maintain these behaviors after, as fatigue gets worse, as their um, heavy handed measures are going to be ever more necessary. But I think um, once again, that um, your, your question really highlights the need for policymakers to kind of, as we say, to separate the wheat from the chaff, to think really carefully about what are the two or three most important behaviors that we want people to engage in? Are there ways that people can reduce social distancing, can start to interact with one another and still um, keep their risk of contagion low? Policymakers, the, uh, once again, the, the best is the enemy of the good. The best might be for everyone to keep social distancing, but that may not be feasible. And so policymakers need to think about how to um, instruct people to reduce their risks while, um, but, be, but be realistic about how, what people are likely to be able to do for how long. This is very similar to the, what's called the harm reduction strategy for addicts, um, where like, for example, needle sharing is an example of a harm reduction strategy. It acknowledges that um, addicts are going to take the drugs, but tries to reduce the harms and the risks from doing them. We need to think about harm reduction strategies um, as opposed to just hope that, that people are going to maintain these strict behaviors in the face of growing fatigue. That's very interesting. Um, uh, there's this really nice question. So it, it's basically given the uncertainty in the time timeline of the pandemic, does the inability to see the end of COVID-19 disincentivize social distancing? I, th um, I think it absolutely does disincentivize social distancing. I mean, people were on this earth for a limited period of time. And I think like if you're long, if you're young, you're thinking to yourself, um, I only, um, this is my youth. I don't want to lose my youth sitting by myself or with just with my family. If you're old, like I am, you're thinking to yourself, I only have a limited number of years left. And I want, I want to take advantage of those limited number of years. And when you don't know how long it's going to last, there's a great temptation to just give up on social distancing because um, no one is going to be ready to um, socially distance for an indefinite period of time. And actually this relates to addiction. I think one of the reasons that addicts um, take drugs, if they stop taking the drugs for some period of time, they, the cravings would decrease, but um, it feels, to an, it feels to, an, like, to an addict like I'm going to crave forever until I take the drug, and so they take the drug. And similarly, for 
people engaged in social distancing, this feeling like I might have to be socially distancing forever. It's just, an, it's an overwhelming feeling and it's going to lead to defeatism and defeatism is going to lead to people um, giving up on social distancing. So um, unfortunately, nobody has a crystal ball and nobody knows exactly when the virus, is, when we will sort of defeat the virus, whether or when, but um, I, I think that um, optimistic messages can once again play a useful role. The idea that there might be a virus, if, if people believe that there might be a virus on the horizon, then they'll think, oh, it's worth waiting. It's worth, uh, um, I, I want to not get sick until before the virus exists. So if, the, if there is this prospect of relatively imminent relief, then people will, um, if there's hope, then people will continue to, are much more likely to continue to take measures like social distancing. But if they have the feeling that this could go on forever, there's very few people who are going to be ready to maintain social distancing measures. We have a lot more questions. Someone working from home, how it'll impact work culture as well as a host of other. What I'll do is we'll compile these and maybe get some thoughts from you, George, later on and then share them back with everybody who attended today. Um, I think if we're hitting the hour, it might be good to wrap up. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, George, for joining and sharing your thoughts. Uh, we'll post a recording of this online as well as share key takeaways over the next few days. And we have all the questions that have come in. So we'll also collate those and hopefully get more responses out um, in the coming few days. These were um, fabulous questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. and. Thank you for inviting me to do this. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.